Welcome. It looks like everybody got to see the little sausage factory in the background. Got to show you all the all the ways in which we manipulate the, the share screen when we think you're not watching. Uh, welcome. We are thrilled to have you join us for our Lunch and Learn series this winter. I'm Tammy Thompson, Outreach and Conference Manager and just basic clown. So uh, you're welcome for that little show. Um, I'm delighted to spend this time with you. I always enjoy our webinars. I learn so much each time, and I am I am thrilled to let you see a little bit of uh, the background too. So we'll just say that for today. Uh, we return this month to revisit the topic of the dreaded calorie pear tree. Uh, when I say we are revisiting, we want you to know that today's webinar is a portion of the webinar we aired last spring. Ryan Armbruce did such an excellent job in his presentation. Uh, we didn't see a need to re really reinvent the wheel. Uh, although the presentation is a re-airing, we do have Ryan and Matt Garrett joining us live at the end of this presentation to take your questions and offer new information uh, for control methods, uh, any progress we've made so far, and uh, efforts to, to curb this, this problem. So although Ryan's presentation focuses on the infestation within, within Kansas, his presentation applies to Missouri as well and our surrounding states. So before I talk about today's topic and introduce our speaker, I wanna make just a couple of announcements. First of all, we are incredibly grateful to the Kansas Forest Service and the Johnson County Parks and Rec District for their support of this broadcast. And we're also grateful to you for your support of our webinars and our programs. This webinar will be recorded and up on the Deep Roots website by Monday. You will receive an email with that link and any resources mentioned during the broadcast. So watch your email and our website. Uh, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll be notified each time we upload a video as well. So during the program, please put your questions in the Q&A tool on Zoom. We will get to as many of those as we can at the end of the broadcast. Uh, I'll be using the chat feature to share links and other information uh, by our speakers, but also feel free to chat with each other in there as well. So here we go. Once a popular ornamental shade tree in the 1950s, we have quickly learned that the calorie pear tree, also known as Chanticleer, Bradford, uh, aristocrat uh, is an invasive, overtaking roadways, woodlands, and grasslands. According to the Missouri Department of Conservation, a single wild tree can spread quickly by seed and vegetative means, forming dense thickets within just a few years. The calorie pear is a story of unintended consequences. We intended to plant a fast-growing, strong, sterile tree, and what we ended up planting was an ecological disaster. Although many of us planted this tree, myself included, before we knew better, we can now take steps to curb its wrath, and we need to. So let's get this party started. Uh, I am honored to introduce our speaker today. Ryan Armbrust is the Rural Forestry Program Coordinator for the Kansas Forest Service. He has oversight over the state's implementation of forest stewardship and forest legacy programs in addition to supervising the district foresters and staff within the rural forestry program. Ryan is a passionate and knowledgeable expert tackling the health of forests in Kansas. As you will see shortly, he is working tirelessly with communities in Kansas to improve upon all efforts to improve forest health, tackling issues even beyond invasive species. So without further ado, I will roll tape, and this time I will uh, stop sharing ahead of time so you don't have to see all the steps I take in the meantime. So just hold tight. Let me see if I can go ahead and get my screen shared for everybody here. Bear with me. Things are processing. There we go. All right. So 
Uh, absolutely, uh, Stacia's right. We're dealing with unintended consequences of an otherwise pretty impressive tree in terms of its resiliency, in terms of uh, the number of things it does. Um, but uh, I think it's worth taking a look back to see how did we get to where we are? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, out myself as not just a forester, but uh, sort of a history nut too. And uh, hopefully you can bear with me because we're gonna kind of take a dive back in time here for a moment to find out how we got to where we are. And ultimately I'm gonna share a little bit about what I think we can do about it. And then I'll hand the baton off to a couple of my other uh, esteemed colleagues on the webinar tonight. Uh, but without further ado, Calorie Repair in, in Kansas. And I would highlight that uh, Kansas is certainly not the only state dealing with this. Obviously, we know that Missouri is, but uh, we're in, for better or worse, good company with a lot of other states who've been wrangling with this. But it's interesting that we're at this point because clearly we all recognize now something is happening here. Um, but it hasn't always been the case. I'm uh, not that old, but I remember very distinctly not that long ago getting laughed at um, when people would, and I would say, I think calorie repair is going to be a problem. They'd say, there's no way. It's a sterile tree. You're nuts. Um, I, I remember thinking about uh, early 2000s that uh, basically the tree just stunk, um, literally stunk. That was the worst thing I could say about calorie repairs for the most part, that I didn't like the way they smelled. Um, started to get some reports. We were hearing from some people who were, you know, keeping a key and eye on, on observing what was going on in the system around them saying, you know, I think I'm starting to see some seedlings here and there. That's, that's sure strange for a tree that's allegedly doesn't produce viable seed. Um, there was a, a nursery owner, um, that, uh, when I was working in, in Nebraska, uh, North Kansas city that, uh, was starting to see some, some seedlings, they thought along the Creek. And we thought that's sure curious. A couple of years later, um, the photo on the right here um, is actually from a, a waterway in Lincoln, Nebraska. We said, well, how about that? We've got some calorie repair down there. Uh, at first you think white flowers, yeah, maybe it's just wild plum, but no, yeah, yeah calorie repair down in that waterway. Um, shortly after that, I, I took a job here in Kansas where I'm at now and um, started to see suspicious white blooms. Now I'm, I'm used to seeing white blooms in the spring, wild plums along our roadways and I like to mark those, make a mental note, go back, you know, in August and September when the fruit's ripening to go pick some to make jam, but these, these certainly weren't wild plums. Start to look around a little bit more by 2014, I, I'm noticing this is real. This is starting to get worse. We're starting to see this a lot of places. It's not just here and there. It's not just in old nurseries. This is, something is, is happening here. We're not sure what the dynamic is, but something's clearly happening. Um, by 2018, we, we finally have, have achieved sort of full buy-in from a lot of our partners here in Kansas. We can all agree that at least we should no longer be recommending this tree, that the, the cons at this point are pretty strongly outweighing the pros of, of an otherwise pretty tough tree. In the last couple of years, as we've started to lean into it a lot more, we, uh, we wrote a grant to, to intensively map where calorie repair infestations are actually occurring throughout Kansas. Um, Spoiler alert, it's all over the place. I've got a map I'll show you uh, in a few more slides here of where we found it, but you start to look for it and you start to find it everywhere. And I'm sure my colleagues over in Missouri have a similar story of when you started to look and you trained your eye to see it, you kind of had that moment of, oh my goodness, this stuff is everywhere. What are we gonna do? Uh, this last year, we were fortunate enough to work with a, a national field trial uh, to do some herbicide uh, replications on some plots to see what can we actually do about it? And uh, we'll have a publication coming forth uh, soon with some, some real world recommendations on what we found to be effective, but I'll, uh, I'll make a couple of allusions to what we found um, effective here, uh, here at the end of the uh, presentation. But this is one of the first places where I really had my eyes open to this. This is uh, just from Google Earth. It's amazing when you could see invasive plants from space, by the way. But this is just for a Google Earth comparison, same place in, in Lenexa. Um, I'm not gonna, identify, you know, who, who manages this land or anything like that, but just in Lenexa. And I remember driving past here at one point, uh, sometime between 2011 and 16, going, what in the world is going on over there? And you can see starkly here, um, we have a lot of conversion of an undermanaged land there with a lot of calorie pair. You can actually see some of the white blooms. The 2016 shot was early enough uh, in the season, March or April, you can see the white flowers there. This wasn't the only spot. I can find pictures like this from all over Kansas. Here's a few of them. This is uh, just outside of Mays, Kansas, northwest of Wichita. Uh, it's a fall picture, but just in the course of 10 years, we went from having nothing out here 
to pretty solid calorie pear. These are pretty mature trees already. By the time they get this large, uh, they're putting out lots and lots of fruits. So these aren't just taking over this landscape, they're serving as a massive seed source for adjacent landscapes. Well, here's down just by El Dorado, uh, another rangeland, and all of a sudden we've got a whole lot of woody plant material showing up here. Again, some of this is Eastern Red Cedar, honey locust, probably some hedge. The majority of this is calorie pear. Ottawa, same story, undermanaged landscape. All of a sudden, over the course of uh, eight years here, it went from just a few scattered plants to a whole lot of woody plant material out there. Here's one in Topeka. You can see how highly managed this, uh, this parkland was with a lot of mowing. Uh, just a couple of years, letting the gas off the, the mower there, and all of a sudden you have significant numbers of calorie pear coming in there. Then, of course, here is uh, in Johnson County, a similar situation where we had pretty much nothing within this pasture land, and then about every single one of those green dots on the right side there in the course of seven years is now a large calorie pear. And you can see this if you just drive around on the highways throughout Kansas and, and probably throughout Missouri as well. You start to see, especially this time of year, we have a late spring this year, so maybe it's pushing it a little bit further, but I know in Southeast Kansas right now, late March is a perfect time to see this. You can do calorie repair surveys at highway speed where you see this stuff show up. Nice white flowers by the side of the road. This is by Chanute. Here's one over by Sycamore, Kansas. Here's another one by El Dorado, just off the turnpike. Here's a, a really stark one over by Arc City. And this is pretty typical for all across Kansas at this point. And this has been happening pretty, pretty rapidly where we've seen this conversion over just the last, about the last 10 years of really having to hunt for this stuff to be able to find it everywhere. So this is an example I'll, I'll mention here. This is uh, not far from me, Geary County, Kansas here in the Flint Hills. Um, this is adjacent to an old nursery. Um, and I wanna take a little bit of a deeper dive to show you what it looks like actually under this stuff when, when it, we have advanced infestation. So down ground level, you do have a little bit of grass still left at the edge of this. And you can see sort of a early, uh, early invader right there in the middle of the grass. And it doesn't take very long for that to become canopy closed. And you essentially have a desert underneath this stuff. So as you try and push into this, you'll see just almost nothing underneath. You'll have a bunch of calorie pear leaves. You'll have bare ground. You'll have a few straggling bits of grass. They're still trying to hang on, but for the most part, this becomes essentially a desert. There's nothing under there. You're not gonna have any wildlife really using that. You're not gonna have many insects. You're certainly not gonna have the sort of biodiverse uh, you know, plant material, you would assume you're going to have them in the Flint Hills with all kinds of native grasses and forbs. And I want to show this picture. This is a park in Topeka. And at first glance, this actually is pretty aesthetically pleasing. It looks pretty nice. But I want to highlight here, instead of showing where the invasive calorie pear is, I'm going to highlight just with some green there. That's pretty much the only trees in this shop that aren't calorie pear. Everything else, obviously, except the grass, is a calorie pear. So this has gone from otherwise functional grassland with a few trees to becoming a monoculture of calorie pear really rapidly. So again, I want to pull back and think, okay, this is where we're at now. We can all probably recognize that we have a ton of calorie pear out there. Oh my gosh, this is, this is taking over. How do we get to this point? So I want to pull back and look at the historical view here because calorie pear, obviously it's an invasive plant, wasn't always here. One of the components of being invasive means it has to be non-native to that ecosystem in question. So where did it come from? Well, it, it came from Asia. It's a well-adapted plant from a similar sort of continental climate in Asia. That's why it does so well here. It was selected because it would do well. It was selected because there was a problem with fire blight on, uh, on edible pears, the horticultural crop that you'd you know, get in the, the supermarket. It's a problem with fire blight on that. So um, really well-meaning researchers found a, a species that was very resistant to fire blight, very tough, very drought resistant. It was honestly just a great solution to the problem they identified. So in 1909, it was brought over by um, some plant explorers from the Arnold Arboretum associated with Harvard University. By 1916, it was released as an official release from the USDA for use in, in um, grafting uh, for these uh, edible pears. Um, but by 1950, people were realizing there's some ornamental value to this crop that we're just using as a rootstock. 
you know, maybe we should pursue something with this. It has these white flowers. It gets some fall color. It is really tough. And I'm, I'm telling you, a lot of people will still grow calorie pears out in Dodge City and Garden City out in Western Kansas. And you've got to be a tough tree to succeed there. So this is a tree that really met. It was a great solution for the problem they were having. And what's more, they said, you know, we have this clonal cultivar we're going to release called Bradford. We really like it because it's, it's self-sterile. It doesn't produce fruit. It doesn't have thorns. We're going to plant it everywhere. In fact, we're going to plant whole rows of it all over the place. Nothing but Bradford. And then we kind of sat there for a long time. The problem with Bradford, of course, if you've ever seen old Bradfords, is they peel like a banana. You get a heavy snow load, you get a wind load. This is a super common site. It's recognized as this, this is going to be a problem. We can't continue to promote Bradford everywhere. So never fear. We can always release more cultivars. We can improve those branching angles. We can go from having really narrow branching angles with included bark to much wider, stronger branch angles here. And we had New Bradford, Chanticleer, Aristocrat, Cleveland Select, which I think is actually the same as Chanticleer, Red Spire, White House, Stonehill. It goes on and on and on, all kinds of new cultivars. But here's the key. All those new cultivars are now new genetic material. So instead of being a self-sterile cultivar that's a clone, Bradford all over the world, now we have diverse genetics out there. It can cross pollinate. Thus, we get to where we're on, we are now. We have lots of fruit being produced. That fruit has been cross pollinated. It's got viable seeds. All it takes is a bird to eat it, do its thing, and we have seedlings. So one of the features that this cultivar was, was promoted for right when it was released, this is a press release that was in the New York Times of all places. I don't know if the New York Times still runs a press release about new cultivars, but in January 1964, it has this press release that says, Bradford Pear has many assets. I would agree. I think it also has a lot of liabilities at this point, we recognize. One of the assets was saying, it has abundant fruits. They're the size of small marbles. They're considered an, an asset after leaves have fallen. And they're saying, if they're not eaten by birds or squirrels, the pears dry up and disappear. There's none of the objectionable littering common with other fruiting trees, things like crab apples, things like plums, all of these other fruiting trees that they'd have for their flowers. So they recognize, yeah, there's some fruit on this, but don't worry, it's not a concern. Well, I'm not going to blame the New York Times, but I am going to say that it turns out it is a concern. So we continue to have this plant be promoted, even though we know this is a concern. And, and calorie pear isn't the only one that has entered um, enter the ranks of invasive plant concerns from the horticultural trade. And that's not necessarily to say the horticultural trade is a bad actor, but by no means. A lot of times we have unintended consequences that happen well down the road from what was otherwise a, a pretty thorough assessment of benefits and, and drawbacks to a plant. But we do know that now this is a, a concerning plant. Um, and these are just a few tags that I pulled that um, off of online websites today. I, I kind of tried to hide exactly who is selling these, you know, to protect the innocent and not so innocent. But calorie pear is still continue to be promoted and sold. And so I would just caution everyone, please don't plant them. And if you have a, a, an otherwise wonderful garden center or nursery you're working with, um, maybe take a moment and try and try to have the conversation about, it may not be in the best interest to continue planting this plant, even though it's a reliable performer. So I mentioned earlier that we in Kansas had this uh, intentional effort to try and map where calorie pear was. Um, and honestly, this started from me being in a place where a lot of people didn't believe me that I see it all over the place. And I had anecdotal accounts and photos and I could say, gosh, I know I've seen it in your county. People would say, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's there. I think you're seeing things. So we worked with our Department of Agriculture and helped pay for a part-time uh, technician to actually go and do what we call a quarter county survey. So we had someone drive up and down county roads and make at least several survey points in each quarter of a county in Kansas. And long story short, you can look at the map and see that every county we looked in, and this was for east and half Kansas, every county looked in except for three. And I think if we went back and looked in those three, we'd find it again. We found infestations of calorie pear. And this doesn't just mean we saw a tree growing in the park. It means we saw small seedlings in a ditch somewhere. We saw a grove somewhere that it clearly wasn't planted, wasn't a, a maintained landscape tree. So. It's not that uh, some of the white spots in this map don't have it. They just maybe didn't do such an intensive survey as we tried to do. Uh, this was just last year that we completed this survey. So long story short, it's out there. It's everywhere. We know how it got there. We know how it's going to continue to spread. So that kind of
prompts the question, okay, now what do we do about it? And I would just take a couple minutes and share a few of the strategies that we've been looking at in Kansas, because in some cases, the, the resources we're concerned about in Kansas are similar to other folks. And in some cases, there's a little bit of difference there. And uh, I might be a little bit biased just because I live in the Flint Hills, but I think preserving our, our tall grass prairie, which um, is, is unique and very important, I, I think is worth quite a bit of effort here. So how do we kill it, right? Well, the way we tend to kill woody plants in the tall grass prairie is with fire works really well. It is the main factor why we have functional prairie ecosystems that have lasted and lasted to this day because of the routine use of fire in a fire adapted ecosystem. Well, what we found is that calorie pear, boy, you really can't kill it with fire very effectively. So here's an image I'm going to go ahead and I, I see actually Matt Garrett is joining us. I've got to give credit where credit's due that this is actually Matt and his team. Uh, they routinely do prescribe fire in Shawnee Mission Park, which is wonderful. That's one of the ways that they help preserve their ecosystem. We routinely do the same thing here in the Flint Hills. This is uh, just last spring, one of my neighbors um, burning their pastures. Most of these folks burn their pasture every single year, every spring, maybe they do a three or five year rotation, but for the most part, they'll run fire across this about uh, April 15th every year. Well, unfortunately, this does an okay job controlling most woodies, especially eastern red cedar, but it really doesn't tend to touch the calorie pear. So as an example, this is a, a pasture pond just a couple miles from my house. I drive past this almost every day. Uh, over the last few years, I've noticed significantly more woody plant material around this pasture pond. And I can tell you for sure, the guys who burn this, they'll run a big head fire across this every spring. It's not for lack of heat that they're putting on the ground that these things aren't being controlled. So just to kind of help pick out what we're looking at here, this is a lot of green. Everything I circled in red there is a calorie pear, and there's more. This is essentially probably 70 or 80% calorie pear vegetation out there, and it's going to push out everything else that's out there. It's gonna push out the dogwood, it's gonna suppress the cottonwood regeneration, the willows, the things that we maybe want out there in that sort of wet pasture pond area. And you can see some of those are getting further out into the grass. Uh, they're gonna to continue to get out there into the grass. One of the reasons that there's so much right here is that we have that big cottonwood. It's a great place for birds to roost right after they've eaten some calorie repair fruit and uh, deposited the seeds. So I'll show just a few slides here of, of some of the management strategies that we've tried to have here that do have some potential of working well, uh, because fire alone isn't gonna cut it, which, which is really tough because fire alone is such a good way of managing things uh, for us in the Flint Hills, but fire alone isn't gonna touch this. So we did a project a couple of years ago where we worked with a forestry contractor who went through with a really impressive forestry unit on the front of his skid steer. It could just go and take down an entire, you know, 12, 14 foot calorie pair right down to the ground, had a couple of folks walking right behind that and spraying the cut stumps. The takeaway from this is that what we found is that mechanical control by itself does not work. Unless you mow every single year, like in a utility right away, a street right away, something like that, the calorie pair is going to come back. Just simple mechanical mowing is, is only going to make that calorie pair angry. It really respruits from routes so strongly that just mowing isn't going to work. And even mowing and immediately following up with chemical only works to achieve partial control. You've really got to stay on top of this. As an example, here's an old nursery. We could see just two years after they, they stopped mowing it routinely, Every one of those little green things in between those older rows of mature trees, you guessed it, it's calorie pear. And uh, I can tell you, this isn't just from aerial view. This is, I've walked this and I, I can verify this is it. In fact, this is where we did that project. And I can show you, this is that cycle we get when you just do mowing alone. So you go from mowing, it looks great. You've really knocked all that stuff down to in the upper right hand corner there, you see, boy, we got a lot of sprouts coming back. A year later, you've got a lot of root sprouts come back and all of a sudden they're two, three feet tall. And this will ultimately just go right back to where it was at if you don't follow it up with some sort of herbicide application afterwards. So without delving too deep into herbicide recommendations, I will say first, always read the label, always wear PPE, the label is the law. But in general, I would say we've got different options here. One, foliar sprays can work, but you have to keep in mind that it has a thick waxy leaf and you're gonna want some sort of surfactant or something like that to really get control there. Where foliar might work really well is as a follow-up to mechanical control. There are some direct applications you can do from basal bark sprays, which 
can work very well and you can do all time all times a year but it could be a consideration when you have many 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 stems uh hack and squirt and cut stump we found in our study were both extremely effective um near 100 percent control on those but again high labor very intense way better my overall recommendation try and take care of this stuff very early by the time you get an advanced infestation you're really going to struggle with controlling this it's going to be really really tons of labor on this so i just want to show a couple pictures real quick here uh this is uh, part of that project doing some cut stump treatments uh we did a cut stump treatment in june uh real quick zip that thing off with a pruning saw sprayed it uh just on the cut surface came back a year later um or or at the end of the growing season, we had no re-sprouts on any cut stump treatments we did. Similar with a hack and squirt treatment where you basically just hack into the cambium with, a, with an ax or a machete, spray a little bit of herbicide on there. We come back several months later into the growing season, no regrowth, dead as a doornail. So these we found really work well um, and we hope to have a publication with some of these specific recommendations coming out pretty soon here. So I'll wrap it up right here. And if you have any questions, um, I would say, you know, absolutely please ask some questions at the end of this presentation. We'll have some time after my colleagues have gone. Um, but please follow up with me, especially if you're in Kansas. If I get an email from someone in Missouri, I'll respond. I, I'm not going to discriminate. But especially if you got any questions in Kansas, um, please go ahead and follow up with me. And I'd love to talk about how we can kill this pest. Well, that was outstanding. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan, I'd love to invite Ryan to the stage, and now, and I'm also would like to. Hey, you did a great job last year. Thanks. <laughs> like to, I still agree with I think everything I said. <laughs> I agree with everything you said, and, and and you know after reading it or after seeing it twice, I think I have a couple of other follow up questions. Sometimes you just need exposure to this education a few times to really understand it. But I'm also honored to bring to this virtual stage Matt Garrett. Matt is the Natural Resource Manager for Johnson County Parks and Recreation Districts. Uh, Ryan does reference him so in, in the video. Uh, Matt is a passionate conservationist who oversees 8,700 acres of natural areas in eastern Kansas. Uh, working tirelessly to improve and maintain spaces. He is an expert conservation leader in large-scale prairie restoration, invasive plant removal, and leveraging volunteers for ha habitat restoration, which sometimes is harder than the work itself. So welcome, Matt, and welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Um, so we do have some questions in there, but before we start uh, answering questions. Is there anything you guys, um, anything that's happened over the last year that you'd like to share that we didn't maybe cover? Well, I, I, I might just say we've certainly got more public interest. I certainly see more emails coming in. Um, you know, the, the gentleman who's sort of followed behind me in the forest health role, um, another guy named Ryan, Ryan Rastock has seen, I think, a lot of public interest there and had some projects. So we're, we're seeing some at least from my perspective, seeing this issue sort of bubble up a little bit more and have a lot more people recognize that this is this is an issue, that doesn't mean we have any silver bullets yet um, to deal with this. But it's encouraging to see at least a lot of other people take notice of this and want to take some action. Yeah, and I'll echo that, that not just the public, but with park maintenance staff, we've really done a great job educating folks. And recently in Shawnee Mission Park, we've taken down 40 large mature calorie pairs that were an iconic LA um, along our theater in the park road. And uh, originally when we had the conversation, park maintenance staff were uninterested in removing those trees. And over the last year, they, they have jumped on new knowledge and they have begun taking down um, the large, most iconic, images that people have for part of that park and they understand that it makes life really hard on natural resource staff to have the seed bank being thrown out to the natural areas okay. and so our regular park maintenance folks have been able to assist our natural resource staff with taking down some of these seed sources for us so yeah we've been seeing some nice positive directions yeah you guys got a uh, like national press on that too last year didn't you yeah, we had a KCUR story, an NPR story went wild and went all over the Midwest and the nation. And I think um, separate from just some of the education we did locally, um, that news story went all over the place. So it's been really great. 
It was real. It was outstanding. And you guys did a great job of, of showing the KCU, our staff, how, how it's done. It's excellent. Um, well, thank you both for your, your time today. Uh, we'll just pop right into the Q and a, um, Audrey asks, are there any efforts in Kansas to restrict the sale of new calorie pear trees? I know there are in Missouri, although we haven't gotten there yet, but in Kansas, Ryan, I'll let you answer that. Well, maybe either one of you would know. Yeah, I, I could tell you, I'm not aware of any efforts. I know that one thing that we did do was, um, you know, with collaboration with some of our partners who helped maintain the, the different Kansas recommended tree lists, we no longer, um, you know, recommend calorie pear really in, in almost any setting outside of perhaps one or two very special cases, but we no longer recommend it in any of our publications. Now, when it comes to actually having it be be listed, um, you know, by by the state of Kansas or something as, as something that's restricted for, you know, nurseries to sell, I'm not aware of any efforts there. Um, I would say I, I would I would welcome that, but I think it's really important for us to focus on where we can make a big difference. And at this point, the number of trees that would continue to go into the landscape represent a much smaller contribution to the seed source than the existing stuff we have out there. So I would really like to see us you know, focus on removing what's out there on controlling, especially those early infestations where you have, you know, a few uh, seedlings, um, you know, in a ditch or some undermanaged area, because those are going to freely cross pollinate, produce viable seed and and serve as sort of that foothold for it to launch out into other places. Um, so especially in, in areas uh, wh where I think of um, at the edge of its infestation range in, in central Kansas, where we just don't see the density yet, if we can get that taken care of first, that's going to make so much a bigger impact in the future than than just a restriction on nurseries. I think a lot of the the better nurseries are already taking it voluntarily off their list. They're recognizing yeah. it's a problem, and and that's where I see um, that occurring. I, I just involuntarily saying we're we're going to be a you know better serve our customers by not continuing to offer this tree that we know has a few issues. Yeah, that's and and you know that's the best we can do right mm -hmm. now. And and good nurseries, good arborists aren't aren't recommending it, so that's excellent. Um, David asks, do you use Gordon for control? And I imagine that Gordon, it, Gordon is um, an herbicide manufacturer. Um, I'm wondering if they meant Tordon. Tordon maybe. Tordon is a Gordon project, so maybe, or product. So maybe, David, if we're going to address Tordon instead of Gordon. Uh, so if you have, go ahead and put the, a new question in there if, we're not, if we don't have it right, David. So Matt, do you want to handle that? Otherwise, you know, we we can ping pong back and forth. I don't I don't want to talk over you at all, Matt. You know, sure, you know. I, we've had success using Tordon um, in the field, uh, but I'll defer to Ryan since he's done actual field trials with multiple herbicides, and so it's been effective for us. Um, but I'll I'll let Ryan speak more to some of the research he's worked on. Sure. So so the first thing I would say about Tordon is uh, a lot of people are familiar with it as sort of the standard for cut stump treatment, just because it's widely available, comes at a convenient little squeeze bottle, uh, sold as Tordon RTU. The active ingredient that is picloram, uh, which does have some soil activity. So I would say there is a higher potential for sort of off-target impact when using Tordon if you're not very careful about applying it. In addition, Tordon has a pretty restrictive label in terms of the sites it can be applied on. Um, so if you are considering using Tordon just because of its availability, carefully read that label and make sure that the site you're considering applying it on actually is on label for that. Um, I would say what I've seen in, in the assessments we've done, the research we've done, is that there's a lot of active chemical ingredients that are sold under the broader name of you know, brush control that are very effective. Um, we don't have to go, if you're doing a cut stump or a um, sort of a hack and squirt, uh, you know, girdling treatment on this stuff, um, the active ingredients glyphosate, the active ingredient triclop here um, work very well and in some cases are, are cheaper. So I would go with the cheapest, most effective uh, herbicide formulation that also has the least opportunity for any sort of uh, off-target impact, flashback, uh, soil uh, persistence. And, and for me, most of the time that ends up being, uh, you know, a careful and judicious application of glyphosate ends up ticking most of those boxes. Okay. Um, and I want to remind our viewers that if you, uh, we are looking at the Q&A on Zoom to answer your questions, uh, we can't toggle back and forth very easily. So if you have a question in chat, we, if you would pop it in the Q&A tool, that would help us a lot. Um, Ryan, follow up with the um, with the applications and the effective um, uses. You mentioned that you have a publication you were hoping to get out um, in last year's webinar. Where are we with that web with that pub? 
Yeah. So one of the things that we're waiting on is we were fortunate enough to participate in sort of a multi-state regional um, herbicide assessment trial. And so that is is currently getting its sort of final um you know, statistical analysis done on some things. We we hope to we hope to have that be in place and be um, you know submitted to the proper journals and that before we then use that as a basis to sure. to have that publication. There is um, more or less some uh, some recommendations that we can make that you can find on our website under the um, invasive plants tab on the KansasForest.org. Um, there are some recommendations saying that we have seen these particular application methods and chemistries and all that. Um, seem to be reasonably effective. We're hoping to then have that really be built out um, once that um, uh, that peer-reviewed study that is a cooperation between uh, South Carolina, Georgia, U.S. Forest Service, and and we here in Kansas. That that'll really help backstop that with some you know good sound data. I I think we stand on a pretty good foot in terms of what we've seen, but we always want to backstop this with good data. I know. Um... Ryan spoke briefly about fire in his presentation and how dormant season fire and some other seasonality um, buys you some time, but it doesn't necessarily um, help that much. And we've been experimenting with growing season fire, and we've been experimenting with September fire on some of these calorie pair areas. And we're hoping to this next season see kind of what the response is that going out on a 90 degree day and putting some serious stress on some of these plants. Um, has, is something that our park district is kind of investigating in the moment. And we have two or three project areas. And so we're hoping to do a couple more cycles of this growing season fire and hitting these plants at kind of a weaker moment. So I, I don't know, Ryan, if, if anybody else is trying that right now um, in the region or trying to, to hit maybe with fire at a different season. Yeah, so we've seen a lot of interest in the past few years uh, based on some really good research from uh, Casey Olson at K-State and uh, John Weir at Oklahoma State based on growing season burns, having really huge efficacy on, um, you know, driving down some undesirable plants, whether it's Cerisio lespedeza or some of our native but undesirable woodies for, you know, sort of grazing systems. Um, on the back of that, we think there's a lot of potential, exactly what you're saying, on, on helping drive down calorie pair. Um, because where I live, I, I see a lot of the, the ranchers that, that live right near me, you know, they've been for the last 140 years or so um, burning in a early season, you know, March or April burn um, every year. And I see calorie pair now continuing to persist and even expand under that sort of fire regime. Um, I'm optimistic that we're going to see, uh, you know, that being driven down a little bit. Now, simply running a fire through there in September is not going to eradicate calorie pair, but I'm optimistic that's going to help stress it more and perhaps allow us to do a follow-up application of some herbicide in a much more targeted way where we're, we're having less labor, less time, less chemical will have to be put out on the landscape to really drive those populations down. So this is sort of all of a whole system we're trying to develop. And um, if if anybody out there who's who's on this is also aware of anybody who's trying to manage this with growing season burns, we're very interested in doing some um, sort of objective assessment of that as well. Um, there's potential for a sort of some follow-up research looking at the impact of growing season burns um, on you know the the stem density and persistence of these um, these invasive plants. Yeah, I know that after my burn, I burned one acre of our prairie, just one, and we had fifty. I I treated fifty um, little tiny calorie pairs that were still. I mean, they're easy to find once you've burned, um, but I treated fifty. I counted them because I thought, wow, and that's fifty in a year. You know, so it was, it's it can be. You know, if you can get on top of them, it's a whole lot less next year. But but yeah, it's it can be a lot. Now, um, Bailey asked a question, and Matt, I think this is probably going to be either one of you could probably answer it, but I bet you have experience here. So Bailey asks, what's an estimated per acre cost to hire a contractor to remove these trees or hack and squirt treatment? I'm a local park staff who is trying to figure out a budget request to tackle a heavy infestation and won't be able to manage the labor in house. Um, that's Bailey Patterson. Um, so that might be something you can offer off screen or maybe you can offer now. Yeah, I can talk roughly about some other invasives we manage with like a per acre cost and I can reach out to Bailey offline as well. Um, when we're talking about bush honeysuckle, which is in a forest landscape and more complicated to get equipment in, we're looking, depending on the density, at anywhere from $800 to $3,000 an acre. 
to remove bush honeysuckle from a forest. Calorie pairs out in a, usually a more open landscape, depending on the severity, unless it's become the novel ecosystem of cedar and calorie pear that's almost impossible to work through, which is almost a land clearing effort. Um, I currently don't have any conservation bids that it has forecasted out that acreage, um, but um, it's it's something we're interested in as well as getting a kind of a menu of conservation contractors that can help some local municipalities do some bids that would allow different cities to maybe use the same bid and get some of these contractors rolling in the Kansas City area mm -hmm. and, and doing some of this work that is um, not currently available locally. But I don't know if Ryan maybe has some folks um, with him that could give us maybe some of that land clearing advice. Yeah, so I I can give you one real world example from that study we did at the old nursery, um, which was very heavy infestation. I know, uh, Tammy, you were talking about finding 50 stems in your one acre. Um, there are a lot of places where I would kill to have only 50 stems, you know, add yeah. a couple oh, absolutely. for a lot of the infestations we see. So it's going to be highly dependent upon, um, you know, the size, whether it's one acre or 40 acres upon the density, whether you've got just a few scattered trees that like we've done with, you know, a a chainsaw and uh, you know a, a squirt bottle of doing hack and stump or whether it's so dense you have to take in you know a uh, forestry skidster with a mulching head on it and or uh, you know basically a, a giant brush hog on the top of a uh, or on the front of a, a skid steer and just basically start over you know I don't want to say nuke the landscape but basically there's nothing there except calorie pairs so you take out almost all vegetation and hope to get restarted so what we saw was was we had a bid from a contractor who ended up doing about three acres of heavy infestation work, um, ended up being about in that range Matt was talking about, right, at about $2,000 an acre. And honestly, after he got that done, he said he underbid it and he ended up kind of, it wasn't enough to pay for all of the time he had to have out there with staff. So if it's really heavy infestation, this, this is not a, a cheap undertaking. Um, and I would say, too, that there is no uh, sort of single entry treatment that I'm aware of. So you're going to have um, multiple stages of go in, knock it down, follow up, follow up. Right. And so like, yeah, and the way I write my bids with contractors is we do an initial effort where they clear the landscape and then we pay out half and then we allow a 30 percent payout when they've come back and treated resprouts. And then we do a final payout when they have a 95% kill. Um, and that's where they get their last piece of, of that money back. And so we try to make sure that it's all, it's not just a one and done situation that we want to hold that contractor to being in that landscape and making sure that they spend the better part of a year taking care of it. And so when we're dealing with push honeysuckle or anything like that, we, we try to make the the bidding process good for the contractors, or there's also an escalation where they do get into a situation uh, where the next year herbicide costs have gone up or fuel costs have gone up. And we don't want to hem these contractors because there's so few of them around to help us with these efforts as we try to allow them to escalate a little bit each year during the pandemic prices just went off the charts on numerous things. So trying to keep some of these operators running and helping us with these projects has been challenging, but some municipalities can write these bids in a way that keeps these folks working and helping us towards these management goals. Yeah, I've got two quick things I'll tag in on there. One is uh, if you're listening to this and you want to be a, a forestry or natural resource contractor, please do it. We need more of you out in the state. Yeah. There's so much work to be done. <laughs> we, we, we'd love to help get you trained, get you a um, you know, figure out what the landscape is out there you can be working in, but we need more contractors. Um, secondly, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we have a, a limited pot of money, but we do have uh, access to some small funding that can help actually put some of this work done on the ground, especially, and really we're going to try and limit that to, you know, some public spaces, demonstration areas where we can learn something and then, you know, help. So if if you're in a position where you have some, some you know, publicly managed land that you have an infestation on, you'd like to do some work, reach out to us. We we do not have, I'm not talking about a million dollars. I'm not even talking about a hundred thousand dollars. I'm, I'm talking about much smaller amounts of money, but we do have some limited funding that can be used to help support actual on the ground work here. So reach out to me, reach out to Kansas Forest Service and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Outstanding. And we had a couple of questions. I'm just going to answer these live. Uh, folks wanted us to provide Ryan's email again uh, and website, and we send out resources after each of our web webinars so that those things will be included in the in the resources as well as any references we have here. So here's never, my business card. I'm just there, sorry. I'm just exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we will and we'll send you we'll give you his home phone. And like his mom's <laughs> phone too, just in case she hey, you know, he's at her house or whatever. 
you can contact him wherever. Hey, if you're interested in killing calorie pair, I'll, I'll you can be talk happy. to anybody whenever, <laughs> right? That's right. Uh, we, Peg asks, is this infestation worse in the middle U.S. than in other U.S. areas? And I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you we've seen at some other states, including Indiana, um, South Carolina, and a few others recognize this is so, so much of a problem that they have taken proactive steps to either, you know, like um, put it on a banned list where it can't be sold restricted list in nurseries and that. It, it's not only us that's de dealing with this problem. It is, uh, I would say we're at the Western edge of where we're seeing the, the issue. Um, but I know for, for certain it's all the way east to South Carolina where it's a major issue. All right. And Nancy Chapman, I will answer this question myself. Nancy Chapman asks, when will we see more on the 2023 buyback program? At the end of this broadcast, Nancy, we will announce that just shortly. Pam asks a great question, and this is a common, common problem. How do you get rid of the shoots all around the tree and the stump? You treat every single shoot? Yeah. And I, I would say um, making sure you at right after you cut, treat. Don't cut and then wait a couple weeks or even wait a few hours and come back and treat because you're not going to get good herbicide uptake on that. And you're going to actually, I, I would say if you cut and walk away from it, you're going to create more of a problem than if you cut and then immediately treat with, with chemicals. You know, I, I'm not an advocate of necessarily you know better living through chemistry and everything, but this is a problem that we're going to have to involve, you know, judicious use of chemical herbicides in order to get ahead of it. So um, yeah, if you've already cut it and now later you've got a bunch of stump sprouts coming up, now you have a bunch of smaller yeah. uh, stump uh, or sprouts you're gonna have to take care of. And unfortunately each of those has much smaller cross sections. So you're gonna potentially get less herbicide uptake into that larger root system. And, and it's just gonna be, you gotta stay on top of it. I don't know, yeah. Matt, you cut down all those, what did you say, 40 trees. Uh, what was your experience there with stump sprouting on those? So uh, after staff removed those trees, they immediately went out with a skid steer and augered out the entire uh, stump. Um, so there, there was nothing left. Um, it was a pretty mechanical operation for the, for the staff in that region. So um, they, they absolutely removed everything. <laughs> and everything. What we, what we said last year was sometimes an unnatural problem calls for, you know, the, the chemical solutions, like the less natural solutions. And, and yeah. unfortunately that's, that's kind of where we are with the calorie pair. I think, uh, Sean asked a great question. Should the tree be girdled for the hack and squirt method roundup can be used? Well, I, I would say the hack and squirt itself is you're creating, you're hacking into the, the bark, into the cambium and pulling that back a little bit with whatever tool you're using and applying um, a little, a small amount of herbicide directly to the cambium there. So if you do that and then girdle below it, you're actually going to be working against yourself. So I wouldn't combine girdling and hack and squirt. Now, if you do like a double ring girdle with a chainsaw around it and apply that to those, um, to where you've girdled it, that that is a girdling method, right? You can do that, but I wouldn't combine hack and squirt and girdling because you're going to work against yourself. Okay. Yeah, hack and squirt is de definitely a different technique. You're not trying to hack around the entire um, circumference of the tree. You're, you're literally making a cup for the herbicide in a few different spots. Okay, that's good. All right. And we're going to get, we've got, I've I, just for our viewers, I've list, I've, I've actually taken a picture of all of the remaining questions, but we're going to do one last question. And that's going to be from Karen, um, her question, and then we'll get the quest answers to the rest of the questions. Um, after the broadcast. So Karen asks, what is the best way to identify the calorie or Bradford tree, Bradford tree as opposed to similar trees that are non-invasive? Great question, Karen. Matt, you want to take the first whack at this? <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, yeah, you're the forestry expert. I'm a prairie guy. Um, but it's easy, obviously, in the springtime to look for the blooms and making sure they're not the, the plums and some of those other species. And then you've got the leaf cover, a uh, color in the fall, but I'll let Ryan speak maybe a little more to diagnostic means uh, of managing it. Sure. So the first thing I'd say is if you want to identify it at highway speed, look for in usually for most of our area, mid-March, you're going to see upright white blooms, right? If you're seeing white blooms that are sort of horizontal in ditches spreading out, that's likely to be uh, one of our native, you know, wild plums, American plum or um, uh, sandhill plum. 
But if you're seeing lots of upright columns, in fact, I'll pick up my water bottle. If you're seeing a lot of stuff that's upright, like a water bottle like that, that has white blooms on it, you're likely looking at calorie pair at that point. Um, if you're not trying to identify it by the blooms, if you go out in there, you're going to see, again, a strong upright structure of most of the seedlings. In a lot of cases, you're actually going to see um, uh, thorn-like structures, not true thorns, but a, a thorn-like structure that's about an inch to two inches long sometimes along with those buds. Um, I've actually got um, part of the publication we're putting together has a lot of good identification photos in it too. Um, and this is sort of a, okay, I, I realize I'm taking it out here, but the more you see it, the more you sort of pick up the, I recognize you, I, I know you, but the best, easiest time of year to identify it is in the spring with those upright booms, blooms. You'll see it in the fall as well um, with the, the red fall color um, on the leaves. It, it is, I'm, I'm not going to not beat it on the bush here. It's, it's a pretty tree. It's got nice white flowers and nice fall color. I will say, um, and actually someone else in the room here just mentioned it too, uh, use all of your your senses, including your olfactory senses here too. Those blooms are not fragrant. They do not smell good. There's a lot Gross. of different descriptions about what they smell like, but none of them are positive. So if you go smell that flower and it's not pleasant, that may be a good signal that it's not one of our native white flowering species. Well, that's, that is great to know. I am so thankful to both of you too. Uh, this is the second year in a row we have tackled calorie pair on our webinars. And I feel like um, we could probably do one once a month and still learn more. I mean, there's just so much to, to learn about them. Uh, our audience has asked great questions. So thank you too for answering all those questions. Uh, folks who have questions left in the queue, we will get to those. Uh, we'll answer those with the um, resources and the webinar link, um, the link to the recording when, we, when we're finished with this. It'll be out by Monday. Um, so thank you both for your time. We really are so grateful for your sharing of not only your time, but your expertise and kind of that real, like real life experience when it comes to tackling some of these harder topics and making it make a, make sense to those of us who aren't arborist foresters, or, you know, we're just, we just care about, we just care about our environment. So thank you. I, I wouldn't undersell sell that. That's really important. We really appreciate just the public interest and support because uh, we can only do so much. You know, Matt does amazing things on the area he controls in Johnson County. I try and do what I can to, to spread the word and look at stuff, but none of what we can do is going to be effective without the, you know, participation and support of, of everybody who's on here. So I want to thank you guys too. Yeah, it's, not all, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we definitely have successful areas where we have pushed this species back and it's it's not every every location isn't lost and there's definitely ways to push back and and definitely don't don't be super discouraged because with enough time and effort and volunteer help and, and funds from resources like we can start to turn the tide on this so yeah don't don't leave this pessimistic. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd like to point out that our friends in Missouri, Missouri Department of Conservation and the Missouri Invasive Plant Council, they are doing outstanding work too on the Missouri side, um, and and we are connected to them and their efforts as well. So uh, I think everything you guys said, they would echo for sure uh, when it comes to control and being really on it and uh, trying to get fewer in the ground and more out of the ground. Uh, so thank you both, though. Really appreciate that. So I'm going to move on and let you all know, uh, let our audience know about a few things that are coming up, um, which are, I think, are pretty exciting. Um, first of all, oh, this thing always kind of gets me. First of all, we have Native Plants at Noon, which occurs every third Thursday of the month. This month, we will return to the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center with Alex and Sydney. I think you all know Alex and Sydney because they're famous. Uh, and so I'm so excited to see what they, uh, these two Native Plant Sweethearts uh, have in store for us. So please join us on the 16th for Native Plants at Noon. And to answer the question we had in queue earlier, today is the day we are kicking off the 2023 calorie pair buyback program. I'd like to point out a couple of things. Uh, Kansas City area, Kansas City, uh, which includes Lenexa, Topeka, um, and Lee Summit, our events are going to be on a different day than points east in Missouri. So you may see some uh, advertisements for the calorie pair buyback program in um, 
in eastern Missouri, St. Louis, Columbia, Joplin, those kinds of areas, uh, those dates are different. So be sure to uh, to look at the link we send you in our resources and check out the dates and locations for the Cal Repair Buyback event uh, for Eastern Northeast Kansas and the KC area. So we're really excited on April 22nd, which is Earth Day, uh, Topeka and Lee Summit will host calorie pair buyback events. And on May 20th, Johnson County Parks and Rec, uh, Matt, Matt will be hosting a calorie pair buyback event uh, in Lenexa. So we are so thrilled to bring that program back. Uh, just to answer a few questions I had last year, it is a one for one. So if you cut down 12 calorie pairs, we don't replace it with 12, 12 native trees. Um, it's a one for one. We want to spread as much awareness to folks as we can. Uh, we would love for you to cut down 12. We would love it, love it, love it. So if you cut down 12, you will not only get one native tree, you will get our undying gratitude, but you will only get one native tree. So anyway, the Lee Summit um, plant sale that, that I'm showing right now will have forced healing there too, which sells native trees. So I'll head right into that. The calorie pair buyback event will occur during the Deep Roots Native Plant Sale and Earth Day Festival. So we're going to have a plant sale, calorie pair buyback event, and an Earth Day Festival in Lee Summit on Earth Day, April 22nd from 10 to 2. We are thrilled uh, to not only offer the buyback event there uh, for folks who register, but also allow folks to um, purchase native plants from Missouri Wildflowers Nursery, Forest Keeling, Black Roots, and, and Taylor Creek. So a really, really great event, and we are thrilled to offer that. And watch for the details when I send you the links for the calorie pair buyback event. Uh, check out all of our events and webinars on our website at deeproots.org slash events. And while you're there, if you would consider making a donation, we would be grateful. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will see you in a few weeks for Native Plants at Noon. And always remember, what you plant matters. Thanks. Bye.